In the book Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, the young wizardess Ginny Weasley wrote scary texts in blood on the wall, while obsessed by the evil spirit of Tom Riddle. You may ask a strange question. Who has copyrights to this text? Ginny or the spirit? And surprise, the question was considered by courts in the United Kingdom and the United States a long time ago. Hi, this is Copycast. We are talking about intellectual property and related stuff. Here are me, Viktor Gorsky Machalov. And me, Anton Indrusiak. We are intellectual property lawyers who want to share cool stories between our court hearings. So, enjoy! Let's kick off with the British uh, Cummins versus Bond case, which was heard in uh, 1926. Miss Geraldine Cummins was a journalist who was practicing as a spiritualist medium in her free time. Uh, if you are looking for a new hobby, just think about it. Uh, her senses looked like she was covering eyes with a left hand, taking a pencil in a right hand and rested it on a paper recording over 2000 of words uh, in an hour and a half without any pause. Uh, sounds like you are talking about most people on the internet. <laughs> yeah, or about some judges or legislators. Uh, but anyway, uh, sometimes the sessions were attended by a man named Bond, Frederick Bond. He was keenly interested in the uh, work of Miss Cummins. Uh, one day uh, he published her records uh, with the headline The Chronicles of Cleophas. Of course, without any permission of uh, Miss Cummins. And then she sued Bond for copyright infringement. Her arguments were simple. Uh, she's the author of the texts, uh, so Bond has no right to publish them without her permission, and he uh, didn't have it. Arguments of Mr. Bond were more interesting. First, Bond stated that he was a co-author, uh, because during spiritual sessions he placed his fingers upon the back of Miss Cummins and upon the medium's hand. Oh, so she had a chance to become a Bond girl. Well, something like that. So he placed his hand upon her hand when she was writing, so he was influencing uh, on the situation and the spirit's messages. Uh, secondly, Bond argued that Miss Cummins was not an author at all, uh, because she had just recorded what the spirit told, uh, the spirit's messages, uh, but not created them, so the true author was the spirit, of course. Uh, the poor judge had to answer both questions. Uh, and had to answer the great question. Do the spirit has the copyrights? Uh, regarding the argument that Bond participated in, in creating the work, the judge ex expressed a simple point. Uh, the work was created in the mind of Miss Cummins, so there was no any co-creation by Mr. Bond. That's, that's obvious. Uh, the opinion about copyrights of spirits was much more interesting. The judge said that he was not prepared to make the opinion that the authorship and copyright rest with someone already domiciled in the other side of the inevitable river. That is a matter I must leave for solution by others more competent to decide it than I am, the judge added. So, Miss Cummins was recognized as the author? Yeah, but uh, the judge didn't say that ghosts have no copyright. He just said that he was not competent enough uh, to state that. So, let's make an assumption that ghosts and spirits are able to be copyright owners, and uh, they just can't get a recognition of this in the earthly life courts. Now we make a leap 15 years forward to another continent to see what the United States uh, District Court for the Southern District of California said about copyright of spirits in Oliver v. St. German Foundation case of uh, 1941. This case is even cooler. 
In this story, the name of our hero is Frederick Spencer Oliver. He was born in uh, 1866 and he was a medium too. But contrary to Miss Cummins, he published his book with recorded messages of a spirit himself. The book was called A Dweller on Two Planets. And you can read about it on Wikipedia. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I see. Uh, it's written here that um, uh, in its introduction, Oliver claims that the book had been channeled through him via automatic writing, visions and mental dictations by a spirit calling himself Philos the Tibetan, who revealed the story to him over a period of three years, beginning of 1883. Uh, oh my! That's right. When Oliver was 17, the spirit named Phyllis began to tell him cool stories and this had been continuing for three years. Poor Oliver had no choice but to write them all down. That's horrible. Yes, truly horrible. Anyway, for your information, Phyllis was from Atlantis. So he discovered to Oliver a lot of amazing stories about his land. He also described such Atlantis technologies like wireless telephony, television and anti-gravity. Wow, and um, uh, tell me, how the patent system of Atlantis works? Anton, please be serious. We are not discussing patent system of Atlantis and spirits. We are discussing uh, copyrights of spirits. So, Oliver's book was published by Borden Publishing Company. One day they found out that another company had published uh, Oliver's book too, without any permission, of course. That company was pushed by Borden Publishing with cease and desist letters. Uh, that company filed a claim to the court with a statement that the copyright to the book belongs neither to Oliver nor to Borden Publishing, as the true author is Phyllis. Of course. So the judge had to answer something about copyright of uh, spiritual creatures and it's pretty funny that the judge's name was Dawkins. Oh, like Richard Dawkins. Yes. Who is a famous popularizer of science and atheism. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, Judge Dawkins, okay, it's funny. Uh, was very imbued with arguments about the fact that Oliver emphasized the statement he is not an author of the text, but Phyllis is. No, Dawkins didn't limit uh, himself uh, with babbling about the absence of his competence uh, in the rights of other world entities. Dawkins supplied the Estoppel Doctrine. In accordance with the Estoppel Doctrine, a person cannot refer to any facts in court if previous behavior of the person demonstrated person's disagreement with this fact. Dawkins analyzed the book and found out that Oliver really denied his authorship and stated that the author is Phyllis. Oliver didn't lose his copyright because of this statement, but he lost the opportunity to protect them in courts. Yeah, it was a pretty elegant decision. The judge also added that the law deals with realities and does not recognize communication with and the conveniences of legal rights by the spiritual world uh, as the basis uh, for its judgment. So it's quite ironical that the judge made statement about Oliver's rights uh, then Oliver uh, had already died. So uh, in fact, uh, he was a spirit himself. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> on the basis of these two decisions, uh, we can make two conclusions. Uh, the boring one, judges are not competent enough to make judgments regarding ghosts' copyrights. Okay, uh, the funny one, uh, jurisprudence in the United Kingdom and the United States basically does not deny ghosts copyright, so we just need a jurisdiction that will be competent enough here. Follow us on any podcast service like uh, Spotify, Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts and so on. See our videos on uh, the YouTube channel Copyrighted Dreams and read our posts. 
Ciao. Ciao.